I really honestly believe that the magnitude of the opportunity that we're chasing is something that won't exist for us again in our lifetime and probably not for, for several lifetimes. Um, so at a high level, there, there's $114 trillion in AUM uh, in the United States alone at wealth managers. Yet the technical penetration of the industry is in the first inning. There is the majority of, of RA, 75% of wealth managers, don't even have a form of digital communication beyond email. So there's awful client experiences, there's awful advisor experiences, and what it does is it hamstrings the advisors from being able to scale their business. Welcome to episode 34 of the Atlas Pod. As always, I'm Tobias. What's up, guys? I'm Shaval. Dude, two remote episodes in a row. I know, what, what's man. going on over here? Man? Yeah, man. Look, I'm still stuck in Nashville, hopefully getting out on Sunday, if not Monday. Um, just to give the audience a little bit of, I feel like I owe the audience a little bit of an explanation here. You so, owe me an explanation. I mean, yeah. where, where's my guy? Yeah, dude, I, I missed the in-person. Um, I actually picked up a pack of uh, Allagash beers here, but I was like, you know what, I can't, I can't have one without you, so we'll, <laughs> we'll have to have a good drink of the week next week. But look, we, we invest in real estate in this area. Uh, usually things go really well. We've worked with some good property managers in the past, and then you know, every once in a while you deal with a situation where you got to get your hands dirty with tenants and toilets, and this is, <laughs> this is one of those situations. We had a we had a tenant that moved out. They've been in. They've been in this home for like four years. We thought everything was good. We do the annual inspections. I don't know what the hell happened between last year and this year. They moved out. The place is a disaster. So had to had to get the place back up and running. Renovations. You know, getting the trees trimmed, painting this, that, and the other. So, you know, luckily Nashville has a very vibrant economy. A great, uh, great yeah. number of people who can do good work. Um, it's not like we're out in the boonies somewhere, but hopefully wrapping things up, you know, by the end of today and actually might be able to enjoy a day in Nashville before, uh, before we get out of here. And one thing I'll say about Nashville, we talked about it a little bit last week. Never in my life have I seen so many bachelorettes, first of all, and bachelorette parties doing like party bus in unprecedented ways. Like you'll see, <laughs> you'll see a party bus being pulled by a tractor in the middle of Broadway in Nashville. You'll see you'll see a party bus that's actually like the the metal part of a car is actually just glass. So there's people like in a glass box driving around town partying. Like it's it's absolutely nuts and hopefully we get to enjoy some of that this weekend. Yeah, man, that's wild. It's it's such a wake up call I think for people that are maybe watching this pod who are interested in investing and I know when I first started investing, I actually started in real estate as well. So as soon as I graduated college, I was living in New York City, but I graduated from Dallas, Texas, uh, from SMU in Dallas, Texas. And real estate was so cheap down there. And relative to, the, relative to like the standard of living of, you know, living with two other people in a convertible third bedroom in New York City. <laughs> It just felt like that that sort of arbitrage was not going to exist and people were going to find real estate in Dallas sooner rather than later. So we started to buy and rehab and flip uh, individual, you know, single family homes. But one of the things that, you know, is a, is a stark contrast between reality and the way that it's pitched is it is an incredibly hands on labor intensive operation. Like it is the people that think that they can just buy real estate and it's just like a passive thing. You know, you get a check in the mail every single month. That's just not reality. It's, a, it's absolutely not passive. Now, the question is, can you set up set it up in a way that it's passive for you, a.k.a. you have like a good property manager or somebody on the ground? That may be a different story, but it's certainly not passive. You know, just like when you have a problem in your apartment and you call the maintenance guy if you happen to live in a luxury building. Well, if you're not in a luxury building, you're dealing with like single landlords. You know, who's going to do that? So you have to yeah. court. There's a lot of coordination uh, rent collection from tenants who might be on the lower end can even be can certainly be a problem. So, yeah, it's uh it's definitely it's definitely not passive despite the 
Instagram videos that, that people might yeah. see and <laughs> feel like, oh my God, I should buy some crypto and uh, yield farm my crypto and take out a mortgage and there's this arbitrage opportunity. Well, you know, get, get your hands dirty and you'll see that things are not always so simple. Yeah, man. Um, I was also traveling this week. Yeah, dude, you I, had you had a pretty big week down in Huntington Beach, just south of LA. Yep, yeah, just south of LA. Went to Future Proof down there, which is the world's largest wealth management conference. It was an incredible event. Um, it was hosted by Josh Brown, who runs Ritholtz Wealth Management. He's also on CNBC. He's a big CNBC personality and contributor. Over 3,000 attendees. The speaker list was stacked. You had you know, Bill Gross from PIMCO. You had the head of AQR, one of the biggest quant hedge funds, runs over $100 billion that was there. Um, tons of RIAs, tons of advisors. You had Bob Elliott, who we've spoken about. Bob Elliott was there. Yeah, I got a chance to meet with him. Um, you know, definitely some interesting early partnership opportunities on that front. But it was really, to me, kind of just a, a, a validating moment that we're building in the most incredible space that we can possibly be building in right now. I mean, I think going through the pivot last year, you know, thinking about, okay, we want to get out of kind of the trading business and payment for order flow. We want to build a lasting, enduring company. Um, and whether it was through skill, intuition, or just dumb luck, like finding this wealth tech space, I really honestly believe that the magnitude of the opportunity that we're chasing is something that won't exist for us again in our lifetime and probably not for, for several lifetimes. Um, so at a high level, you, there, there's $114 trillion in AUM uh, in the United States alone at wealth managers. Yet the technical penetration of the industry is in the first inning. There is the majority of, of RA, 75% of wealth managers, don't even have a form of digital communication beyond email. So there's awful client experiences, there's awful advisor experiences, and what it does is it hamstrings the advisors from being able to scale their businesses. Advisors are told you're not allowed to onboard clients that don't have $250,000. And you basically cap out at the number of clients that you can support or at least support well at like 50. So your ability to be able to grow and run a really big book of business is, is really not great. And here we come with a fully digital end-to-end -end wealth management solution. We can onboard clients with extremely low minimums, a few hundred bucks. We can onboard clients that have millions of dollars. We're building the technology products and services that give advisors superpowers. Um, and I think when we talk about that in the community, everyone is just so fired up, which is, you know, it's an incredible feeling. It, 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 yeah. It's nice I mean, that is, that is a super powerful, uh, super powerful message and story to be crafting around the company. And we were just talking about this, like the company and companies that are able to really crack the code on wealth management and the next generation of wealth management solutions, which include high-tech customer-facing solutions, will be the next 100-year companies, the next JP Morgans and Wells Fargo's and Goldman Sachs, and you know the list goes on. So I think the opportunity is, is as exciting as there is. You know, There's a lot of hype around things like AI, but like that's not really the same kind of business, and that's not to say that wealth managers can't leverage AI, but you know, it feels like the most real thing that's out there in the market right now. And it sounds like that was kind of the energy that, that you had at the conference. Is that kind of yeah. like, like maybe give us, give us some of the, you know, takeaways that you had that maybe weren't obvious or as obvious to, to us prior to attending the conference. Like what, what did you learn there? What were some of the cool things that you saw there? Yeah. So I think one of the, the primary takeaways is that the legacy wealth managers are really are really upset about the inability to onboard clients that don't have two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, just for the audience, if you're going after uh, a wealth manager right now, and you you know you're doing Google searches, or maybe you're getting referred by a friend, once you start to make contact with that wealth management firm, they're going to be very up in your face. Is like, hey, do you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars to invest? Because if not, it's not worth my time to talk to you. And I think that's just a an awful customer experience and a really bad business approach. 
Now, the reason why that exists is because they don't have the technology that we do to be able to profitably service that client. And the one thing that doesn't, that no one has, is more than 24 hours in a day. So if you're an advisor, you know, all else equal, you'd rather spend your time hunting down the guy that has 25 million, not the guy that has 250,000. But what we've done is we've said, okay, there can be two experiences. There can be a fully digital product that provides world-class investment management services, that does tax, um, that does financial planning, that a human's not necessarily in the loop, and you can start using that product for, let's say, 500 bucks minimum investment. Um, and what we do by that is we, we unlock the pipeline of people that may not have that 250K at that moment in time, but could grow into having that, and we're gonna help them grow into having that over time, and then we have a relationship with them, so it's unlikely that they decide to leave us for the random person that's calling them up once they show up on a high net worth client list. Um, and the companies that are doing that well, like Betterment started off as um, a robo-advisor, and now they have like Betterment for advisors, and over 50% of their revenue is now Betterment for advisors. So they have a bit of a branding issue where like the world thinks of them as a robo, but they're actually turning into you know more of a, a traditional tech-enabled um, RIA. But the pipeline of people that they're getting into their advisory business is coming from uh, their their robo advisory business. So that was one that was one key takeaway. Two is there's um, an incredible amount of interest from people in investing in alts, and I think the industry, the alternative asset management industry, is beginning to understand that there's going to be value of developing products that are accessible to non-institutional clients. So typically, you know, when you're KKR or Carlisle or, you know, one of these like multi hundred billion trillion dollar asset management private equity firms, the minimum investment to get in is 25 million bucks, right? So like they're only taking money in from pension funds, from, uh, you know, Texas teachers, things like that. But now a lot of these platforms have convinced them that there's a benefit towards working with the RA community because there's this $114 trillion in assets and making the products accessible for like, let's say a five, 10 or $25,000 minimum. And so the way that we're attacking that is partnering with those platforms, developing SPVs, lowering the threshold um, that, that, a, that a client needs to write a check for and still giving them access to private equity, to venture capital, um, but not in a way that, you know, not in a way that they have to like bet their entire life savings yeah. on it, just as a just as a nice risk adjusted addition to their portfolio. And that was the reason why you saw for the first time really big asset managers at this wealth conference, like when they're sent and they're not sending so you know, who sort of who was there? Guy. Who like which? Who are some of the big guys? You said AQR was there. Um, yeah. You said Pimco was there, and this is like in Pimco's backyard of Newport yeah. Beach. Um, you know the, K -K these are KKR was there. KKR Carmine was there. Nice. Was there. Um, yeah, and like you know, a lot of these people, a lot of these uh, organizations have now developed. I met with a guy who works on like the RIA team, the RIA sales team, where they're developing entire West Coast offices just to go out and meet people like us. Like we're, I think, a, a little bit of a different scenario because we're an RIA that's a fintech company, but they're going into, you know, literally like office by office, start at the top floor and work your way down and developing relationships with advisors and advisories in order to be able to get them to put their client money, their client's money into you know, the next KKR fund or the next Carlisle fund. Um, and so that's like, you know, that's a, a, an industry first and same thing on the, on the venture side, you know, like a lot of venture capitalists now are partnering with platforms like Allocate, um, Moonfair, there's a few other ones, iCapital that provide access to, to their funds, um, on a rolling basis. And, you know, and that's, that's something that has very low industry penetration right now, but a lot of demand from the client side. Yeah. And I think the. Like one of the drawbacks, obviously, is this rule about being an accredited investor and having to be accredited in order to be able to invest in some of these private funds. And, you know, 
that's obviously meant to be there to protect retail investors from potentially taking on too much risk or taking on risks that they don't understand. But in many ways, that's a barrier to entry that could be unnecessary for a lot of people if there's a safe way to kind of onboard these clients where much of the best returning uh, companies over the last you know few decades were in the private markets. Like most of the alpha occurred in those earlier stages. So if you're not able to get exposure to that, or if you're not ex able to get exposure to direct real estate investments, like you and I were talking about, you know, you want to invest in a real estate private equity fund, like just not being able to do that is a major inhibitor for average people to build their wealth. Yeah. So finding ways to, you know, allow them to do it safely um, is going to be, is going to be a huge trend. So yeah, that, cool that that I was think, part of it. I think also the thing that's attractive to both advisors and to clients is limiting the day-to-day -day portfolio volatility. So if you're invested in a private equity fund or if you're invested in a venture capital fund or a real estate fund, you know, you're not you're not going to get that Robin Hood experience of logging in in the morning and seeing your portfolio up or down 5, 10, 20, 30%, right? Like these are asset classes that have generally speaking maybe quarterly semi-quarterly or annual uh, or annual marks um, and I think from the client perspective it's helpful to not have to I was gonna say that's probably a benefit it. that's probably a benefit for most people because yeah. a lot of times these investors and I think we'll touch upon one of these topics at some point but like you know if you're always looking at the price and you feel like maybe you start to see some patterns that don't exist and you're like <laughs> well maybe I should be trading around these things a little more frequently and having that illiquidity there and saying like, all right, I'm going to put my money in this thing and I'm not going to look at the price of it until six months or a year or whatever. Yeah. And right. So you, you just sort of, you sort of decrease that, uh, that like sort of volatility anxiety that occurs and turns out that when you have a longer term time horizon, like we do, investment returns are much better. Right, so it's like this private equity fund is targeting whatever twenty percent IRR. Don't worry about you know trying to read every single headline and trying to back into whether the private equity fund is going to be outperforming or underperforming, and then trying to figure out a way to sell your your private equity investment to another person before the fund matures. Like, trust the process. We'll see how things end up after five years. That's beneficial to the advisors because you know they don't have to deal with the intraday volatility, and it's better for the investor as well. Um, the other thing was AI. So I think a lot of people like obviously AI was a huge topic at the conference. It was a huge um, it was a huge focus of companies that were trying to sell various AI solutions. But the thing that stood out to me is. When, when you ask companies that have tried to go to market with an AI product, granted, it's the super early days, so like these things could potentially get better. They're realizing that there's not an AI experience that negates the fiduciary responsibility. So in other words, the client, when they have a problem, strongly prefers to talk to the human advisor. They wanna like, or, or not even if they have a problem, if they have like a question, that is going to be uh, a material dollar amount in terms of what the decision outcome is. They want to talk to a human being like they don't yet trust the, the AI. So the places where the AI is actually being deployed that is um, working in a way that is, is helpful is in like productivity enhancement. So it's basically doing a lot of things like scheduling client meetings, uh, writing, you know, monthly recaps for people. Um, organizing uh, like the various investment memos that need to be sent out to clients if the company has an investment team or like even writing notes I remember writing notes yeah. I remember speaking to one of the uh, RIAs in in the LA area and the president was telling me that you know the meeting notes is a really important feature because one right. you have a record of everything that happened and when you're in a client facing business that can be important but also for liability purposes, you know, you don't want to be, you want to be sure, you know, as an RIA, there's restrictions about what you can and can't say to, to clients. So having that is kind of a productivity enhancer. But one of the, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, because we got into a bit of a conversation about this was, was there like any, any discussion on how financial advisors or RIAs or wealth managers in general 
are using content or how they can use content to grow their business organically or you know grow their personal brand was there was there any discussion about that at the conference absolutely yeah i mean i guess to start josh brown he started off as a a columnist, a writer, a Twitter personality. He was able to build up a big enough following on Twitter to be able to get a full-time daily gig on on CNBC. And he has his podcast now. And he's got his podcast, The Compound, but the entirety of his business runs off of content. And in the modern day, in the modern world, content and marketing should go hand in hand. So like if you want to have effective marketing, it needs to feel like organic content production, not like a an advertising an advertisement. So yeah, like maybe Nike gets a benefit off of hiring a big ad agency to do like a Super Bowl ad. That's not going to be available to you as an individual investor, as an individual advisor or to your RA firm. And the type of ads that may have worked in the past where like, you know, you're taking out a half a page and like investors business daily, that that's not it anymore, right? So what advisors that we speak to are really excited about is our brand stands for being client focused, tech enabled and content driven. And over the course of the last year, we've developed an expertise in how to create content. You know, like people come and watch this show every single week. We have eight, 9,000 different viewers. Um, we know how to do audio, video editing, video production. We know how to do scripting. Um, we know how to do community management. And a lot of these advisors come to us and say like, look, I would love to create content, but I can't. And there's kind of always two reasons why. One is either my firm won't let me because I work for a firm that's just stuck in you know, the old ages and like, they don't want to take on the risk. And it's not just video content. It's like, don't even write something on LinkedIn. Um, and then two is, okay, well, my firm says it's okay for me to create content. I have to get it approved by compliance or whatever, but, um, I don't know how to do all of the production oriented stuff. So can you help me? So when we speak to advisors, that's a service that we plan on providing It's like, we're going to help you develop your own personal brand. We're going to help you develop your narrative. And it's not for the purposes of becoming an internet sensation or creating a piece of viral content. It's for the purposes of creating content that is relevant to the specific audience that you that you uh, intend to service as an advisor. So for example, if you wanna tackle young couples that are maybe having a difficult time with home affordability, we'll show you how to create a five or 10 minute YouTube video where you just dive in and you give that away for free. You give value away for free where you're basically pretending that the camera is the couple and break down how you would how you would structure an investment portfolio and a financial plan that would enable them to be able to buy a house. And it turns out that even if you don't have the virality, what you end up having is those two, five, ten people that reach out that do become customers. I mean that, and that's, um, and that's so that's go. so valuable. As you're saying it, I'm just like laughing because I'm thinking about how obvious it is that this is something that every advisor should be doing uh, obviously barring any restrictions that they have from their firms because like imagine there's a situation where you find a find a guy on youtube or maybe you you know found him through whatever means and then you talk to him once and then he tells you about his youtube channel and you like you have like 10 20 videos on there and you go through each one of these videos and you know, you get a feel for, okay, well, I'm a young couple trying to buy a house. This is how I can do it. And then you get led on to the next thing. Well, okay, well, maybe this is how I create a budget or, you know, this is how I manage personal finances or this is how I start investing. And like, before you know it, you actually get to know this person. So like, there's that experience that you can have versus you literally like call a number and Wells Fargo tells you like, yeah, here, come on into our office and you meet a guy for like 30 minutes. Like, who are you going to make your advisor? Is it going to be the first guy or the second guy? And like, You know, a lot of people don't know how to do it, which is what you mentioned. A lot of them are restricted. And I think the third thing is that a lot of people just don't feel comfortable putting themselves out there. But if they could understand how much value this creates for their clients, I think it it is a really powerful incentive to get started. Yeah, I I totally agree that you need to develop a relationship with the client before the first phone call. Like ideally, the situation is... They find your content, whether it's on Instagram, YouTube, or whatever other social media platform, and before they even call you, 
they're spending time consuming that content and they've already made the decision that they want to become a client of yours and that they want to do business with you and like the quality of the content that you've put out has developed trust with that person and i don't think there's a way to expedite you know going from first point of contact to i trust you enough to help to help uh manage my money than creating high quality valuable content right like i think that is that's the only way of going about it. And, you know, there was a few people there that uh, spoke to their personal anxiety about getting in front of the camera and like how much, uh, how painful that experience was for them, but how much of a, of a, you know, rocket fuel it was for their business and how they were struggling because they were in like kind of the cold calling game or the cold emailing game, started to create content and all of a sudden, you know, onboarded 200 million or whatever in AUM, um, which then gives them more confidence that they're on the right track and that they continue doing that. They tell their friends that are advisors about it. And now there's, you know, a larger and larger cohort of people who want to, who want to replicate that success. Nice. I mean, look, future proof sounds like a major success. We got to, we got to set up the Atlas booth there next year, future proof 2024. I already told them I'm, I'm in, man. <laughs> I told them I'm in, I told them I'm in for two reasons. I told them I'm in because I think Future Proof is an incredible conference. There's a lot of clients, a lot of business that, to be done there. But two, uh, I'm in because I'm a huge fan of Newport Beach. Dude, uh, Newport I, Beach, it's a whole, it's a whole nother world down there, man. I mean, it is some lap of luxury down there, man. <laughs> I, you know, like we went to we went to dinner at Javier's. They got the Aston Martin dealership in the in the parking oh, yeah. lot. Um, Crystal Cove hanging above with beautiful you know sunset views, ocean views. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, Feels the, like and the, the beaches the, there. The beaches there just are like I don't know. You you you're in L.A. You like you used to live in or you still live in Santa Monica. You were closer to the beach before, but like nobody wants to hang out at that beach. You go down to like Laguna in Newport, and it's like. You can literally just be on vacation. You can feel like you're on vacation there, like yeah. 10 minutes away from your house. Like it's yeah. insane. Yeah, it took Kim down. She was also a really big fan. I, we call it the uh, the pothole index. So when you're driving on the roads, are the roads like perfectly blacktop paved? Are they nice and wide and clean? You know, obviously when you're in LA, there's potholes absolutely everywhere. Oh it feels like you're driving on like... You know, you're driving in a roads. pothole in yeah. LA. You're driving in a pothole. When you get down to Laguna and Newport, I mean, look, you can't have potholes when you're whipping it in your Rari and the Porsches, and like you need yeah. to have a nice smooth road for these cars. I know, man. And obviously, we're we're a tech company, fintech company, and we'll probably always be a digital first business. But I also think, like as we scale, you know, opening offices in strategic areas, whether that's Newport Beach. Newport Nashville, Beach is strategic, man. Newport you know, Beach feels very strategic. Feels very strategic. <laughs> so I think there is is, is business justification. Yeah. For I mean, look, all jokes out. aside, there is a there is a large concentration of wealth and wealth managers in that area. Like you know, when you when you look up like a lot of the uh, funds and wealth managers and RIAs in uh, like in the SoCal area, many of them are concentrated within that Newport Beach area because. It's super nice, and then you have that kind of little ecosystem of you have the clients and the advisors in the same place. So jokes aside, it is a strategic location. I'm in, man. I'm in. <laughs> uh, all right, man. Let's talk about Starlink. Let's do have it. You, have you seen this? Uh, so the Wall Street Journal had a story on this. I mean, the numbers to me look incredibly impressive. So the business did $1.4 billion in 2022. That's up from two hundred twenty-two million dollars the year before. I saw so. that. I was like, <laughs> that was like blew my mind because like I think there was a Wall Street Journal article about it, and it's like not Starlink not living up to expectations, and then right. that's like the first line in the article. I'm like, do you like six x to your revenue in a year, and that's like too slow? Right. So I think the problem is that it's far below what their internal estimates were. So we have a we have a graphic. Div, you can throw it up on the screen, but they were pro they were projecting to do north of $10 billion in actual revenue for calendar year 2022. So the red line on this graphic just shows you that they came in well below their own expectations. But what do you think is the bigger story? Is the bigger story that they six or seven next their revenue over the course of 12 months or that you know they're effectively 90 percent below their revenue expectations that they gave back in like 2015. It's a good question. I think on the surface, you know, 
Obviously, 6x revenue in one year is very impressive, but SpaceX, the parent company, has a $150 billion valuation in the private markets last, uh, last any numbers were revealed, and a big driver of that is Starlink. Mm -hmm. So while $1.4 billion in revenue, and I think they were supposed to have turned a slight profit in the first quarter of this year, despite being uh, running at a loss last year, like while that might be a big number and an impressive number, if it's supposed to comprise like 20, 30 percent of SpaceX's valuation, you know, then it starts to look a little less impressive. And I think the issue has been that just there's less demand for the product than maybe they anticipated because the majority of people who can afford high speed Internet live in places like cities where it's readily available to them. Uh, yeah. without having to buy any like additional hardware and having to pay a high monthly cost. Now, the rest of the people in the world who may not have high-speed internet also may not be able to afford it. So I think there's there's been a little bit of an issue there um, from a business perspective and kind of like an understanding of how much demand there would be for this. Now, you can actually buy a Starlink setup kit. I don't know if you've seen this. Like You can like go yeah. to Home Depot and buy one or Best Buy. Um, I think it costs like 600 bucks. Um, and you can like literally just go do it and then you pay $120 a month for the service. And I think they have a premium tier at 250. So it's not, it's certainly not cheap. So if you're like living in LA, there's, there's zero reason for you to buy that versus, right. you know, just regular internet. And if you're maybe in a rural place, well, maybe that price point comes down a little bit, but it's still probably unaffordable. So what do you think? Like, is this, uh, from a business standpoint, like, were you, as impressed looking at the numbers as, you know, we were pretty fired up about this business uh, before seeing some of these numbers. Are you are you still equally uh, excited about it? Yeah, I mean, they made these projections in 2015, right? So the world has changed a lot from 2015 until now. Um, but when you look at what they've been able to do in terms of getting the network operational, there's 4,300 satellites that are in orbit right now. So they've succeeded in what I think was the most challenging part of setting up the foundation for the business, which is you needed to launch enough rockets into space successfully to deploy a global satellite network. Um, so they're ahead of schedule on the deployment of that, but there's still many, many thousands more satellites that need to go before there's full global coverage. Um, and then the question of it becomes around the penetration associated with with users. So in order to be able to get to the revenue numbers that they were projecting, they would have needed like 20 to 25 million subscribers and they're at like a million right now, right? So like they've missed massively on the rollout, but A, they don't do any marketing. So similar to Tesla, um, Elon's strategy with this is kind of just like word of mouth, right? And I think the problem with Starlink is that it's not something that a user sees every mm, single day. It doesn't day. drive past you. You don't yeah. see the chargers. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the marketing for, for Tesla is anytime you get on the road and you see a dozen Teslas or you pull into you know, a, a grocery store parking lot and there's all these Teslas parked there at the superchargers that you've mentioned. So you're exposed to the product on a regular basis just through the course of living your normal day-to-day -day life. Whereas if you had Starlink um, and you were, you know, my neighbor, it's unlikely that I, that yeah, I, you wouldn't that even I know. know about that. So, so I, I think, think, I think had, one of the things- to go marketing campaign. Yeah, for sure. But like, what does that mean though? That does that mean that the profitability of the business is a lot lower than they expected because the forecast didn't account for such a heavy marketing spend. And another one of the things that I learned after kind of diving deeper into this company is that they've been trying to sell into like alternative users like cruise ships and yeah. oil rigs and airplanes and stuff because maybe there just hasn't been enough demand from the customer segments that they were expecting at first. Um, so like that was a little bit disappointing. And then the other thing which makes complete sense, but I think I just didn't fully appreciate at first is that these satellites are designed to last in orbit for about five years. After mm -hmm. five years, they kind of burn up and come back. So, like, there's a need to constantly produce these things and then launch them into space. And obviously, with their rockets, they're able to do that a lot faster, cheaper, and in higher volume than any of their 
competitor. Well, they don't even really have any competitors, I guess, but like anyone yeah. else who would be able to do that. But you know that the fact that they're just like this is a constant capex for them uh, definitely changes it a little bit in my mind. And now I'm hearing that Amazon wants to come in with a competing business. Of course, Bezos, if he hears what Musk is doing, you know he's got to he's got to get in the game as well. But they the funny they don't have the Bezos, network. Yeah, the funny thing is that Bezos is almost certainly a Starlink customer because he's got his he's got, <laughs> he's his got the yacht brand new 500 foot yeah. yacht or whatever um you know so maybe that's why he's like I don't want he's maybe he doesn't feel good cruising around the Mediterranean paying Elon <laughs> he's like I need my own but Elon did um he did the all-in pod from the all-in conference so the all-in conference was happening in LA when I was in Newport Beach and Elon phoned into it via satellite link uh, oh, nice. from from Starlink on his jet and the amazing thing is that the video quality was better than the video quality that we have <laughs> that we have right now, you know, connected to Wi-Fi uh, on the ground. So I think the quality of the product is is great. I would love to see it. It's already in JSX. I'm a big fan of JSX. For anyone that doesn't use JSX, it's like an intermediary between high-end business class and full-on private. Um, so you can fly out of private airports on smaller planes. So the convenience is 10 X, um, but it doesn't cost that much, you know, order of magnitude. It's like maybe a thousand bucks or, or less, which nowadays most first class seats are, are more than that. So JSX, the ticket, the ticket prices have been crazy. JSX, yeah. you put me on to JSX a few months ago, man. It, yeah, man. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. And they use, they use Starlink, um, which when you're on Delta or whatever, United, um, I still think it's uh, what is it, GoGo, and like the yeah. the GoGo internet is just oh my god, it's horrific. They don't even I'm let surprised. you stream. I'm surprised. Yeah, you can't do anything of that requires significant bandwidth. I'm surprised <laughs> uh, Starlink hasn't been able to convert them as customers yet, um, but I'm sure I'm sure that's coming. Um, but you know, the other question that comes to mind when I look at uh, Starlink, obviously, is is SpaceX itself. And, you know, obviously it's a super important company like NASA themselves rely on SpaceX to get astronauts to the International Space Station. There's no other domestic provider for them. But the company has like a hundred and fifty billion dollar valuation in the private markets. Like, is this thing ever going to is this thing ever going to go public? I don't know. I mean, one of the things that we've seen, I mean, the answer is that it should go public. You know, a company that's one hundred and fifty billion dollars in, in the private market that doesn't make a, a lot of sense to me. But at the same time, this is literally a company that is trying to make human beings like a spacefaring species, right? And so is the right way to accomplish that goal um, thinking in quarterly increments for the purposes of, you know, making, uh, you know, investor expectations yeah. for, for whatever EPS is or whatever. And I think the answer is, is clearly not. So, you know, if I'm Elon and I have the ability to continue to finance this business, like it sounds like a lot of the CapEx that goes into both Starlink and SpaceX, you know, has come from the venture capital community um, and in sort of pre-sales of certain, of certain launches and pre-sales of, of Starlink systems. So if that well kind of dries up, then it forces a, a public listing. The $150 billion debut on a company that is doing low billions of dollars in revenue, you know, 150 times revs. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little scary. I mean, this, these, SpaceX has the same market cap as like Disney and Intel. Right. Like, that's pretty astounding to think about in the private markets. But companies that require a long time to become the company that they're they're talking about just are not like super well suited to the public markets like no. if we're talking about a 10-year investment and people's attention span and pressure as a investor is on a quarterly basis it's a bit tough to live up to the hype yeah i mean it's it's a rare thing like a lot of these companies that are big companies now take amazon for example you know amazon went public at what would con what would be considered like series b or series c in today's startup environment. So that was great from the perspective of if I'm an investor, I got relatively early access to this company that became a multi-trillion dollar valuation. But it was also a really, really tough ask 
from Jeff Bezos and the management team at Amazon to not only the retail investing community, but the institutional investing community, which was like, stay with me. My game plan is to lose money for the next 20 years, <laughs> right? And eventually I'm going to have such dominant market share across all things e-commerce. And at the time, he probably wasn't even pitching anything AWS oriented. It's just like, look, we started with books. We're taking over e-commerce. We're going to be the destination that people go to on the internet to buy literally anything. In order to do that, I need to lose money so that we can build fulfillment centers and, you know, like transport and blah, blah, blah. Um, that is a tough pitch today. Like, I don't think, I think that's one of the reasons why the companies that were able to, to do that successfully have huge moats. So the thing that, that SpaceX has going for them is in success, that is their story, right? Like in success, they have a, a monopoly on, on space travel and it's gonna be really, really difficult for any company to be able to replicate that both because it's technically difficult and also because like, where are you going to get the money to even try? Yeah. And I think one, one last thing I want to say about this is that there is a lot of talk in the media about Elon kind of, you know, not being as smart as everyone says he is. And like, there's kind of this narrative that a lot of the mainstream media has pushed. And then I recently came across some notes from people who've actually worked with Elon and the things that this man is able to compute in his brain just seem to be like on a level that is just beyond anyone I've ever heard of. Like there was one guy who said that, I don't remember the exact year, but it was like obviously before he was involved with SpaceX and Starlink that he knew nothing about rockets or anything to do with that. And then a couple years later, he knows more than anyone else. And we're talking about rocket science. Like to most people, rocket science is just like a joke to say like, oh, it's not rocket science. That's literally like the hardest thing in the world to know. And going from like literally zero knowledge on something to being the foremost expert. And by the way, he's also the foremost expert on electric vehicles and like five other topics. Like it's just, it's just incredible. So, you know, if, he, if he's trying to avoid the scrutiny of being a public company for, for SpaceX for a little bit longer than... You know, I'm not I'm not mad about it. Yeah, I uh, I just ordered his his biography. So oh yeah, for it. yeah. Um, I don't know. There's been a lot of stuff on Twitter uh, uh, Twitter about that. So I'm trying not to read too many comments. Oh, I, I didn't mean to be, give you. I didn't mean to give you the spoilers. Yeah, I don't want to be I don't want to be biased going in, but uh, I'm looking forward to to reading that. I got it in in like whatever it's called hardcover dude i'm reading it old oh school. No. old school dude yeah, old i like school. that though I, th I feel like for books like that i'm sure it's a pretty lengthy one too like i don't know you get it you kind of this is going to sound weird but like you kind of establish a relationship with the book in a different way when you're reading a physical copy than you know the audio books which we've spoken about on 2x or you know even even a kindle kind of or like ebook format it's just a little bit different maybe it's just because you know we grew up in a time where that is how you read books um, yeah. But I feel like, I don't know, the, the way you retain information and connect with the story is a little bit different when there's like a physical medium. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So moving to the uh, amateur traders, the DGENs that are, that are <laughs> Elon Musk super fans, there is a Wall Street Journal article talking about the explosion of 24-hour options. Do you want to take this? Like, why don't you, why don't yeah. you give us the lead in for what this is? Sure. So I think... The lead into this dates back to 2019 and certainly in 2020 and 2021 when the market for retail trading exploded. Uh, a big part of that was Robinhood for introducing no fee fractional trades, which means that you could basically trade any amount of money, um, which brought into access to a lot of people. Then there was COVID where people were stuck at home with a lot more time on their hands because they're not commuting. Maybe their companies were still trying to figure out their business strategies so people were just free. Then you layer in the stimmy checks and the fact that you're not spending money on leisure and travel and all these other things. The market for retail trading exploded. And I won't go as far as to call this investing because it's simply not investing. It's yeah. gambling. And now people had, for the first time, had access to the casino in their phones. You can yeah. pick your phone up out of your pocket anytime you want and start trading and taking risk in you know crazy ways. What's one of the best ways to take risk and to gamble if you want? Trade options. 
what are like some of the most volatile and you know high risk options super short dated ones so this concept of like zero what is it zero date options basically options that expire so like the short term options are ones that expire in less than 5 days now there's ones that you're literally trading options that are expiring that day there's like this other new hashtag that came out zero dte which refers to that and if you look at like the google search trends nobody ever looked this up uh prior to a few years ago so the interest in that is just really really high and i think it's it's a symptom of the 2020 2021 like whole meme stock craze and people just like kind of got addicted to gambling in a new format and it's uh it's kind of interesting because there are some studies out i think london business school did a study that said the vast majority of these individual options traders just lose money so like yeah, most course. people are I mean, doing this just lose money it's frustrating for me because look we go through rigorous compliance standards with regulators right and like we get grilled on hey like why is this button here and why is that button over there and you know isn't it possible that the user could be confused and like you zoom out and you're like okay you know we're doing something where we're trying to materially positively impact people's lives by providing world-class investment and wealth management services in a super long format as it relates to our investment horizon. And yet there are companies that get through 24 hour uh, expiry options. So like when I was trading professionally, weeklies were considered crazy because you know, like you, whether you bought them on Monday or bought them on Thursday or whatever, like they expire that Friday. So just to give people an understanding of what the options are, they're puts and calls, which are the the right but not the necessity to be able to buy or sell uh, an underlying stock at a certain price on a given day. So why does this appeal to retail investors so much? It appeals because they can spend a, a low dollar amount. So they could buy like a $1, $2 option. And if they get the direction right, um, that $1 or $2 option could end up being worth thousands you know whatever and, and the and reason the period. reason they're able to do it at a low cost is because with options you're you just, pay just the paying the premium yeah. and each options contract typically is 100 shares so right. you pay the premium yet your your impact on the market or the notional value is a lot higher right exactly so they're getting leverage is what they're doing like they're paying a small amount of like net dollars out to be able to control a large amount of capital through the option because it's a it's on a hundred hundred share multiplier um and for that reason the options are more um attractive to people who want to gamble not to people who want to trade than buying the shares because like when you buy a share you have to put in that amount so if i put ten thousand dollars into apple i own ten thousand dollars worth of apple but if i put ten thousand dollars into apple calls you know, I can control a million dollars worth of Apple, right? And so that now here's the thing. When you're doing an option, if you look at the, the Black-Scholes model, one of the largest determinants of an option's value is its theta. So that is the decay that the option loses in time value. So the closer it gets to expiry and the further away from strike it is, the more value it's going to lose in that period of time. So ideally, if you're uncertain about um, what the stock is going to do in the short period in a short time period, you want to buy options that are further dated. Of course, that means you have to pay more of a premium. So what these people are doing when they're buying these these zero date options is they're putting themselves in a situation where they don't just have to be right, but they have to be right immediately. Yeah, and within seconds or minutes. Within, <laughs> within seconds or minutes, or if you buy it, you know, on at on the open. Um, you know, within whatever the eight hours that the market's open every single day. So who is the biggest winner of this? Citadel is the biggest winner. One of the things that people don't understand about, about PFOF and the way that the way that market making works is that Citadel is sitting there as the designated market maker and they are selling what you want to buy and they are buying what you want to sell. So the way that Robinhood works is it plugs into a Citadel API and when you go to route an order, whether it's a single individual stock or whether it's an option, Citadel says, okay, you, user from Robinhood, you want to buy Apple, we're going to sell it to you right away. And it happens instantaneously. So Citadel sells it to you on the ask, which is the, the upper bound of the bid ask. 
and then they buy it back in the marketplace at the bid and they make fractions of a penny on that. But they do that billions of times a day. And if you look at the numbers, it's a tremendous business. Why are they so excited about the explosion of zero day options? Because the bid ask spread is that much wider. So if you look at a if you look at a, a, a highly trafficked stock like an AMD or you know an Apple or whatever, those stocks have a penny wide spread. So the most that Citadel can make on that is a penny, the difference between the bid and the ask. But if you look at a lot of these zero day option spreads, they're like 30 and 40 cents wide. So yeah. you could make a tremendous amount of money. And like, you know, you would think that the volume associated with those would be relatively benign, but the volume is massive. <laughs> it's skyrocketed. It's skyrocketed. So, so two, two things related to that. So one, the, like, the concept that a lot of people just like fail to understand as retail traders is that when you are buying something, that means that somebody is selling it to you and vice versa. When yeah. you're selling it, there is somebody on the other side of that trade buying it. So as you said, the bid ask spread is basically the difference between what someone is willing to sell it for and what you as a buyer or any other buyer are willing to pay for it. So in like highly traded, highly liquid securities like AMD, you know, that spread is pretty tight. The price is like pretty clear on these options that spread can be quite wide, which means the likes of Citadel and Susquehanna and all these other guys have, have a lot more room to make money. The other yeah. thing is, and I'm glad you referenced Black Shoals, there's like a lot of indirect costs associated with these zero dated options. One of them being, if, you, if the bid ask spread is really wide and you are forced to cross the spread, which means meet, uh, meet the buyer at the price that they want or, you know, or meet the seller at the price that they want, you, know, you are risking buying these options at a price that differs materially from its value. So like right. you might be buying something for $10 that's only worth $5. And like a lot that's contributes to why these people lose money. Like it may not even be that you're like totally wrong on the trade if you have like some intuition or whatever, but like the indirect costs just add up in a way where Citadel and the other market makers are eating up all your potential profits. Yeah, and you know what the other really big input to the Black Shawls, Shawls model is? implied volatility <laughs> so so when you look at implied volatility in most of the names that are highly trafficked the underlying volatility of the stock is extremely high which means that that gets baked into the premium so in other words like you always want to be I've, I've always been a net seller of options yes there is the the sort of outlier scenarios where you sell an option that's super out of the money and you know, the company gets taken out or whatever, and like you lose a bunch of money. But generally speaking, the way to think about the options business is to think about the insurance business. Insurance companies are some of the highest free cash flow generating businesses in the world because they're selling people peace of mind, right? So like I go out and I pay whatever, you know, farmers a thousand bucks a month for like my car insurance, my home insurance or whatever. And like, now I just hope that nothing bad happens and farmers collects that premium and reinvest it. That's what options desks on Wall Street do. They're selling, they're selling options to retail investors that generally uh, uh, expire at zero, but they're also selling options to institutional investors that are using them to offset risk of their portfolio. Now that makes sense if you're saying, okay, I have a portfolio of $100 billion in longs and I want to spend a few hundred million dollars a year protecting the downside of that portfolio. So I'm going to buy, you know, SPY or QQQ puts and you want those to go to zero. Why do you want them to go to zero? Because then the value of your, that means the value of your longs has gone up significantly. So there are ways to be able to deploy option strategies intelligently. I think if you're a type of person that wants to generate additional income and you own a stock, like let's say Nvidia, owning Nvidia and selling upside calls whether it's a week out, a month out, a quarter out, that could be a good way yeah, to take. That, that's to, called to a, make a buy right, buy right a strategy. Buy right. You, and like that's a great that's a great way to generate extra yield. And like the risk there is that you end up having to lose the shares because you know it the, gets called the, away from you. Yeah, up 10 it gets called away, 20, but you made yeah. you still made money on the trade. Yeah, and you collect the premium still. So yes. I don't know. I think I think you know the my my personal view is that there should be. Um, more controls at the regulatory level <laughs> over, I do like, I, I think that, I think it's like ridiculous that, that people that don't know what they're doing are able to, 
to go through the zero day options trading with no consequence to any of the brokers that are out there, which are clearly putting the client in a position where they're most likely to lose money. So that's well that. said, well said, man. I, I think the regulatory interests are not always so obvious to mere mortals like us um, because <laughs> on the surface, this just seems like a very easy decision. I'm just out there working my ass off trying to help people, but you know how it is. No good deed goes unpunished. Of course. Uh, You ready to do the final trade? Let's go. Inflation accelerated for the first time in six months. Is another rate hike still on the table? This is expected because energy prices went up. Papa Pal could probably now have justification to raise rates one more time. UAW called a strike at all three Detroit automakers. Is this a big deal? It's absolutely a big deal. Short the strike, I want things to get back to normal. SoftBank reportedly left millions of dollars on the table with the ARM IPO. Was this still a win for Masayoshi? Yeah, it was a massive win. He still owns 90% of the company. Dumb Money, the movie about the GameStop mean stock mania, open today. Are you watching it? All this talk about zero day options and retail trading, I'm, I'm in there along the movie. Goldman Sachs is launching a sports franchise unit to let wealthy clients invest in sports teams. Are you investing in sports? Have these guys been watching our show? We have an entire <laughs> theme here. Of course I'm investing in sports. EdTech startup Baiju apparently hid $530 million in a hedge fund run out of an IHOP. Can you create alpha off of 24-7 pancakes? I hope is not a breakfast of champions. Short this to the max. All right, guys, that's it for this week's episode of the Atlas Pod. I think it's the last time that we're doing a remote for a while, so please join us next week for another episode. Make sure that you like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you next week.